Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at uh, Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Before we get started, I do want to encourage you to support our listener support campaign. You can become a one-time supporter of the show at support.greatdetectives.net. You can also become one of our Patreon supporters at patreon.greatdetectives.net and support the show on a monthly basis. At the $2 level, you can support us at the rookie level. $4 is our Shamus level. $7.14 a month is our Detective Sergeant level, $15 is Master Detectives, and $30 is Chief of Detectives. And these contribute to long-term goals for our show, such as a better server, a summer series, and the elimination of uh, commercial messages from the start of the show. And each level comes with its own uh, benefits, including um, special uh, tips and uh, monthly uh, email. Full list of available benefits uh, are patreon.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it's time for today's episode of Michael Shane. The original air date is uh, August the 27th of uh, 1945, and the title is Behind the Footlights. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make the new 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. A detective as well known as Mike Shane is in the limelight pretty much of the time. This evening, Mike is not in the limelight, but behind the footlights. Or rather, he is just about to be. A new review is opening at the Empire Theater, and for reasons still unknown, Mike has been asked to attend the rehearsal. Right now, Mike and his pretty associate, Phyllis Knight, are waiting at the stage door. Yes, what do you want, son? We'd like to see Miss Beverly Pryor, please. I'm sorry, son. Rehearsal going on but now. But she isn't... asked us to come. It's business. Oh, business. Well, then, I guess it's okay. Come on in. Miss Pryor's dressing room is number four. Well, thanks. Mike, how long is it since you've seen Miss Beverly Pryor? Oh, years. <laughs> Ten years. We got to be good friends when I spent a couple of vacations down in New Orleans. Seems to me she could have told you what she wanted over the phone. Well, we'll know in three seconds. This is dressing room four. Come in. Oh, my. Hello. You old darling. Let me give you a... <coughs> Bev. Mike, I wish you to pieces, Mike. It's so wonderful to see you again. <laughs> Oh, I'd almost forgotten you were so handsome. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Oh, I almost forgot, too. Phyllis, uh, I mean, uh, Beverly, I want you to meet my... I mean, uh, I want you to meet well, Miss Phyllis... Well, Mike, you haven't gone and got yourself married. No, Miss Pryor. Not yet. I'm Phyllis Knight, Mike's associate. Oh, uh, just in a business way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> How do you do? Beverly, I didn't know you'd gone on the stage. Oh, I was always good at dancing. You remember, Mike. I've got a specialty number in the review. South American dances, rumbas and sambas. Do you like my costume? Oh, sure. It's uh, very colorful. (laughs) Shows off my legs very well, don't you think? Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. You remember what skinny legs I used to Uh, have. Miss Pryor, Mike and I don't want to hold up your rehearsal. Oh, no, no, that's right. Beverly, you said on the phone that you were afraid of something serious happening, somebody connected with your show. Oh, oh, yes, I, I was pretty scared yesterday. Some changes are being made tonight, and, well, I think things will all straighten out now. Well, what was wrong? Well, maybe it was my imagination. We've all been so nervous and hot-tempered. Yes? Well, I thought somebody was planning a murder. Somebody Mm would... What made you think so? Hiya, beautiful. Ready for your spot? Larry says you're going to follow up. Oh, come in, boys. I want you to meet an old friend of mine. Mike, this is our comedy team. Sweeney and March. 
Mike Shane and Miss Knight. Hello. Is the salt set to the pepper? Shake. <laughs> How do you do? They're just dandy, snug as a rug in a bug. <laughs> you get the switch, snug as a rug. <laughs> All friends of Ben's, huh? Uh, well, you believe me, this little gal's going places. You know, this show's just third base for her. Next strike will be home plate, a Hollywood <laughs> Yes, indeed. Sweetie thinks he can sell me to Hollywood. We'd stick to comedy and forget the agent. Now, you business. wait, you wait, you'll see. I'll have Sammy Goldman and Louis B. strangling each other for you. Hey, come on, Sweeney. We're late for us. Okay, yeah, we'll be seeing you. Yeah, uh, sure. Oh, slap happy pair. Mike, why don't you and Miss Knight go out in the wings and watch their routine? Well, I want to get your story first. Now, who was planning a murder? Oh, it's all straightened out now, Mike. After rehearsal, we can have a little supper, and I'll, and I'll tell you all about it. Now, go on, Scoot. I've got to finish dressing. Well, all right. Well, what's the matter, Angel? Haven't you anything to say? Angel. Your vacations in New Orleans must have been very pleasant. Oh, <laughs> yes, very pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> Did I miss a joke? You missed something. <laughs> uh, the hotter a woman gets, the more she freezes. <laughs> Okay, Sweeney, let's take that railroad spot again. All right, fine. You all set? Let's go. Right. It doesn't really matter, Mr. March. Any train will do, but I must have a ticket for Hollywood. Well, I understand that, Mr. Sweeney, but I can't let you have a ticket unless your trip is essential. What sort of business are you in? Oh, well, I'm president of the 12 Flavors to a Foot Sausage Company. 12 Flavors to a Foot Sausage Company, Mr. Sweeney? Yes, you see, we manufacture a sausage that's 12 inches long and contains 12 different kinds of meat. Well, what's the advantage? What's the advantage, Mr. March? Just this. If you're slicing a piece of our sausage and someone comes up to you and says, no matter how thin you slice it, it's still bologna, they're probably wrong. It may be liverwurst. Oh, oh, come now, Mr. Sweeney. After all, how can I give you a train reservation for something like that? Well, if you must know, I've got to get to Hollywood to see my doctor. Oh, oh, you have a serious illness, do you? Yes, I suffer from very bad attacks of bakery face. <laughs> bakery face, Mr. Sweeney? Yes, you see, under uh, my doctor's orders, I wash my face in baking powder and lemon juice. Well, then what happens? Well, I break out in cupcakes. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Sweeney, it seems to me that the thing... Help, help! Wait a minute. Oh, what's, yeah, yeah. What's, what's going what's on? Mike? Mike, it's the old man, the doorman. Yes, and he's pointing into that dressing room. Come on. It's Estelle. Estelle. She's murdered. Wait a minute. I see her. Hell, I see her, Mike, in the dressing room. All right, stand back, everybody. Stand back. You're not coming in here. Who says we're not going in there? I do. I'm a detective. Dad, you keep him out. I sure will. Oh, it's not a pretty picture, Mike. Stabbed in the back right at her dressing table. Hmm. Done with a huge knife special kind of knife with a gold hilt. Mike. Yes? Look the mirror right above her head. Oh, uh-huh. some letters and lipstick. Yeah, she tried to tell us something. It spells B-E-V-E. The rest of the letters are just a red scrawl. Oh, I'm afraid we know where they were meant to be. B-E-V-E. R-L-Y. Beverly. Beverly Pryor. <laughs> We'll return to the adventures of Michael Shane in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, since we told you last week that post-war gasoline was here, many of you have already tried a tank full of the powerful new 76. But just in case the Minuteman in your locality hasn't been able to supply you with the new 76 gasoline, be patient. As fast as the modern 100-octane refineries of Union Oil Company can make and blend it, Our tankers and trucks are hurrying post-war 76 gasoline to you. Watch for the signs to go up in your neighborhood announcing its arrival. Then, for a real thrill, drive in for your first tank full of the new 76. Performance of the new 76 gasoline far exceeds pre-war standards. You'll like its lighter, faster, more powerful action. And you'll like the price, too. It sells at regular prices. No increase. So, to make your old car act like new, put in a tank full of the gasoline of the future, the new 76. Now going on sale wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76, your Union Oil Minuteman Station. 
Mike's backstage visit to the Empire Theater has taken a grim turn. Mike and Phyllis have found a girl stabbed to death. Behind a closed door in the Dead Star's dressing room, Mike and Phyllis tell their story to the inspector. And that's about it, Inspector. The old mm-hmm. fellow who watches the stage door discovered the body. We were out in the wings watching a comedy routine when we heard him yell. The murdered girl is Estelle Caro, Inspector. She was the dance partner of Vic Hunter. Caro and Hunter, they're listed on the billboard. Yeah, sure, kids. But this gal, Beverly Pryor, you say she called you here tonight because you thought a murder was cooking? How does Beverly know so much? Well, you see, Inspector... I see plenty. I see in that mirror right above Estelle's head the letters B-E-V-E written in lipstick. Estelle tried to write the name of a murderer. I was coming to that. Just give me time. Now, Phyllis checked through Estelle's purse, and according to Estelle's driver's license, she was five feet four inches tall. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm six feet tall, Inspector. Yet these lipstick letters are three or four inches above my head. Now, I've heard you, Inspector, lecture your boys on the squad. That a person will usually write on the level with his eyes. Sure, it's a safe generality. Well, then, Mike, you think somebody else wrote the letters B-E-V-E, huh? Some tall person to give us a false clue? That's possible, Phil, but we can't prove it. No, no, but I would like to see a woman who has been stabbed in the back rise clear out of her chair, take a lipstick, and scrawl some letters 12 inches above her eyes. All right, while we're on the subject of clues, what else have we got? Well, I searched her dressing table. It's just the usual stuff. Except for one thing, this old-fashioned locket necklace. Hmm, smear of blood on the locket. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from the murderer's fingers, probably. We found it thrown in the bottom drawer. Yeah, Mm -hmm. but more important, Inspector, look at the inside of the locket. You you can see a patch of glue and a trace of paper sticking to it. Well, there was a photograph pasted inside this. And if we can find out whose photograph it was, I think we may know why Estelle was murdered. Okay, let's start asking questions, beginning with Beverly Pryor. No, if you want, Inspector, I'll go get her for you. Thanks, Phil. Hmm. Mike, has Beverly seen the body in this writing on the mirror? No, no, we kept everybody out of the dressing room. Good, then I think I'll drape this towel over the mirror. Just as well if Miss Pryor doesn't see our own name on the glass. Or any of the others, for that matter. Hmm, this is a peculiar-looking knife. Gold-painted hilt. Must be a theatrical prop. Mm, Probably. Whoever the killer was, he or she must have stood behind Estelle as she sat at the dressing table. And while they were talking, plunged the knife in. Assuming the killer was supposed to be her friend. Oh, sure, sure. There's no signs of a struggle. And no closet for a murderer to spring out of. This may be this window here. Seems to open into an alley. Well, we checked it, Inspector. It was locked. Uh, Miss Pryor, this is the inspector of homicide. How do you do, Miss Pryor? If you don't mind, I'd like to ask you a few questions. I, no, no, of course not. You want to ask me how I knew there was going to be a murder? Yes. Well, I I didn't know. But I saw something during rehearsal last night. Well, that's why I telephoned for you, Mike. And what did you see, Beverly? Well, I, I was standing in the wings, waiting to do my number. Estelle was out front rehearsing her solo. She was supposed to do pirouettes clear across the stage into the opposite wing. And, well, just as she reached the curtain, I saw a long, thin sword slide out through the curtain. I, I screamed, and, well, Estelle stopped. That's all that saved her life. You didn't see who held the sword? I, I couldn't. Did anyone else in the cast see who it was? Well, I didn't tell them. I, I said I screamed because I saw a rat. May I ask why the deception, Miss Pryor? I didn't know who it might be. I, I mean, I wasn't sure. Maybe I just imagined I saw a sword. The stage lighting is so uncertain Yet you took it seriously enough to ask Mike to come here tonight. Beverly, we want you to examine the knife here in Estelle's back. Oh, it's... it's ghastly. Yes, but do you recognize the knife? Is it a theatrical prop? Yes. It's... it's from Harry's act. Harry? Harry Frizee, the magician. The famous Frizee. Would he have any reason to kill Estelle? I don't know. Okay, let's find out. Let's talk to everybody. Oh, I... I'm hey, me. hold on. Come back here. Yes, yes, sir. Who are you? I'm uh, I'm the doorman, sir. I was just passing... Oh, yes, and you're the man who found the body. Yes, sir. I had a telegram to deliver to Miss Carroll and her partner. I thought they were both in the dressing room. When I opened the door, man alive, there she was. You didn't tell me anything about a telegram? Well, uh, I, I forgot. Here, I got it in my pocket. Let me see that. Well, it's addressed to Vic Hunter and Estelle Carroll. Yeah, two or three telegrams in the last uh, couple of days. And so? Oh, Sergeant... That's Inspector. Check with the telegraph office. I want the text of all wires received here in the past week. Right away, sir. Inspector, listen to this. Yeah. Caro and Hunter have booked you three weeks, Club Belvedere, starting next Sunday. Stop. Top deal. Regards, signed McGlynn. Yeah, I have that telegram, please. Huh? I'm Vic Hunter. Oh, Estelle's partner. Mr. Hunter, do you know if Estelle had any enemies? No, not real enemies. She... 
Well, she had several bad quarrels the last couple of days with March and with Beverly. I huh? heard that, Vic. You know it wasn't Beverly's fault. Estelle was jealous. She knew Beverly was going to steal the show. Don't be silly. Nobody can steal a show from Estelle. Then why did she tell me she'd fix it so I'd never dance again? Okay, okay, okay. Estelle was jealous. Let it go at that. Now, what about this fight with March? All right, I'll tell you. I suppose everybody knows about it anyway. I was trying to get Estelle to marry me, but she kept turning me down. We began a fight. I and... told you, March, you were wasting your time on her, but oh. no, no, you wouldn't listen to me. You even had to take our paycheck, my paycheck, to buy her an engagement. Well, she ring. gave it back to yeah, me. Yeah, she gave it back. She'll get your money. Don't worry about your money. money. Quiet, quiet. Did any of you notice anything strange in Estelle's action the past few days? Did she seem afraid or worried? No, no, just a fight with Beverly and March. Mr. Hunter. We found a necklace and locket in Estelle's dresser, an old-fashioned gold chain and locket. Yes, she always wore it. She called it her good luck charm. Whose picture did she keep inside the locket? Why, I think it was a man's photograph. I assumed it was some fellow she was or had been in love with. She never told you his name, Mr. Hunter? No, Estelle was very closed-mouthed. Mm-hmm. I want to establish the time element in this case. Estelle and Mr. Hunter finished rehearsal and then went back to their dressing rooms. Sometime during the next 15 minutes, the murder occurred. Now, during those 15 minutes, where was everybody? Well, I was in my dressing room. Part of the time, Mike and Miss Knight were visiting with me. And Sweeney and I were just buzzing around. We stopped in and gabbed a minute with Beverly and her pals. Yeah, well, we're in the clear. A comedy guy couldn't carve a hole in a gal's back and then go out front and panic them with gags. Sure. We'd be laying turkey eggs all over the place. I'm not the one to say that you didn't, Mr. Sweeney. Huh? Didn't which? Say, listen, if you mean that Inspector... Our... We were going to talk to the magician, the famous Brazil. Yeah, it's about time. Anybody know where we can find him? Well, he was in his dressing room a few minutes ago. I'll show you where it Never is. Never mind if you'll just tell us. Oh, all right. You go right down here. The famous Brazil's dressing room is the last on the left. Okay. Thank you, Beverly. You kids got any ideas yet? I have. Huh? Mm-hmm. I'd like to know why none of these people voluntarily mentioned the famous Brazil. They know everybody in this theater is under suspicion. Yet nobody refers to the magician, mm. the owner of the knife which stabbed Estelle to death. Right. Well, probably because none of them noticed the knife. Aside from Beverly, I'm not sure the others even know how Estelle was killed. Mm, one of them does, Mike. Huh? He said a comedian couldn't carve a hole in a girl's back and then go out and do a gag routine. Sweeney. Mm. Mm-hmm. Well, let's see. This must be the dressing room here. No answer. Well, there's his costume on the chair, but no Mr. Frizee. That's blame funny. We haven't seen him anywhere around the theater. He's just disappeared. Mm, it's not surprising for a magician. <clears throat> hey. Hey, that window curtain. It's blowing. Yeah, and the window's wide open. And an alley right outside. I'll bet he ducked out the window and up the alley. Oh, great. Now I'll have to drag out the old net. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Low gear for a moment, Inspector. Look at that sword rack on the wall there. Sabers, swords, daggers... Yeah, in several blank places in the collection. The rack is minus two daggers, the same type that killed Estelle. And also minus two swords. Swords. Oh. Huh. Oh, what, Angel? I just remembered. When I went out to get Beverly for you boys, I found her in Sweeney and March's dressing yeah, room. Yeah, and... And I saw one of those swords on top of their trunk. Uh-uh. And last night, Beverly saw a sword come out of the curtains intended for Estelle. Mike! Mike, Inspector! What's Beverly? Matter? Beverly, what's wrong? I just got a phone call. A man told me he knew who killed Estelle. Huh? He asked me to meet him in my hotel room. I didn't know what to do. Well, I said yes. Could you recognize his voice? Oh, I think so. He was trying to disguise his voice, but it sounded like... like Harry Frizee. Frizee, swell. Then we know where to find him. Oh, I'm scared, Mike. Everybody in the troop knows I called you in tonight because I knew something. Maybe he's trying to lure me outside. That's exactly what he's trying to do, Beverly. Now, you're going to stay right here. We'll keep that appointment for you. Give me the key to your room. Uh, here it is. It's 9.05. Brazil is right across the hall, number 906. What time did he say to meet him? At 9.30. And it's 9.10 right now. Okay, Inspector, we've got ourselves a date. <laughs> That would be this way. Yeah. Yeah, here we are. That's for Z's room across the hall. And a light shining over the transom. Okay, let's talk to him in his own room. We may get a chance to see something. It's funny. 
His lights are on. This is another vanishing act. Let's try the door. Unlocked. More than that. Look at the doorknob. And my hand. Blood. Mike, is... Is that the famous frisee? I'm afraid the word is was, Inspector. It was the famous frisee. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike Shane in his adventures. How about it, friends? Have you gotten your first tank full of the new 76 gasoline? It's available right now at no increase in price at many Minuteman stations. The new post-war 76 is freshly blended from the huge 100-octane refineries of Union Oil Company. That means you're getting the benefit of the latest in war-proven refining methods when you get the new 76. Its lighter, faster action beats all pre-war performance. You'll notice the difference as soon as you come down on the accelerator. So for a real motoring thrill, get a tank full of the powerful new 76 gasoline. If your Minute Man doesn't have the new 76 today, please be patient. Our tankers and trucks are making deliveries with all possible speed, but some outlying districts of necessity take longer to supply. But whether you're able to buy the new 76 right now, or whether you have to wait a few more days you'll find it the gasoline you've been waiting for. It's the new 76 gasoline, now going on sale at your Union Oil Minute Man stations. For the second time tonight, a murderer's knife has struck. The prize suspect, the famous Frazee, has been killed. Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector have just completed a search of the dead magician's hotel room. Ransack, turned upside down, pulled apart. I wonder what under the sun the killer was looking for. Well, we haven't the foggiest idea what to look for or what's missing. Mm. But at least this time we know the motive. For Z was killed because he knew the identity of Estelle's murderer, huh? You can't even say that, Phil. Huh? Don't forget for Z's knife was found in Estelle's back. He may have committed the first murder tonight, then somebody else killed him. Oh, I want to take a really good look at that body. Hmm. Still wearing his overcoat, so he had just come in. Wound on the back of the head showed the murderer first tried to put him out quietly. Hey, Inspector. What? His wristwatch, it smashed. Yeah, it stopped at, let's see, 8.57. 8.57? Inspector, when Beverly rushed in and told us about Frazee's phone call, remember I looked at my watch? That's right, you said it was ten minutes past nine. Hey, hey, then Frazee was already dead. He wasn't disguising his voice on that phone call. Somebody was trying to imitate for Z. And I'll bet you that somebody made the phone call from right inside the theater to get us out of the scene for a while. Well, if you're right, Mike, it's a darn good thing I phoned the sergeant to bring these people here to the hotel. Hey, kids. What? Yes, Angel. Y- you notice that for Z's right hand is closed tight, in fact, awfully tight. Yeah. You suppose maybe he's got something in his fist? Well, we shouldn't disturb the body till the coroner gets here. Go ahead. Perhaps if I just pry his fingers open. You're right, honey. Mm, let's see it. A photograph, a tiny round picture of a baby. Yeah. And look at the back of the photo. Dried glue. This is the picture that was torn out of Estelle's locker. Inspector, I've got everybody outside for you. Sweeney, March, Hunter, and Sprayer. Okay, Sergeant. We'll talk to them one at a time. Bring in Sweeney. Yes, sir. Mr. Sweeney. This thing gives me the creeps. When are you guys going to stop finding bodies? Mr. Sweeney, you have one of Frizzy's swords in your dressing room. Mind telling us what for? Oh, that. Well, March and I borrowed a couple of them from Frizzy. We were cooking up a burlesque on his magic act. Mm. We figured we could get some laughs. Uh-huh. I see. And now, uh, will you look at this photograph here? Sure. Do you recognize this baby? No. That's all, sir. Okay, Sergeant, bring in March. March. Mr. March, would you explain why you had one of Frizzy's swords in your dressing room tonight? Sure, we've had him a couple of days. Sweeney and I were going to do a takeoff on Frizzy's act. Yeah. Well, that checks up. Do you recognize the baby in this photograph? Mm, no, sir. Okay, thank you. That's all. all right. Sergeant, Mr. Hunter. Yes, gentlemen? Oh, Mr. Hunter, we found that photograph which was missing from your partner's locket. You have? Good. Yes, yes. Here, this is it. A baby's picture, and as uh, we recall, Mr. Hunter, you said that there was a man's picture inside. Well, there was the last time I saw it. She must have changed photographs recently. Do you know who this baby might be? Not the slightest idea. Thank you. 
Mr. Hunter, will you send in Miss Pryor next? Oh, yes, Inspector. Yes, I will. Excuse me, Inspector. Yes, Sergeant. One of the boys just came from the telegraph office. Here are the copies of all the telegrams sent to the theater. Swell. Then hold Miss Pryor outside till we've read them. Yes, sir. Let's see. The first wire is four days ago from Chicago. Regret to inform you your father passed away last night. Stop. Will you attend funeral? Sign Norman L. Tyre, gang cop and tire attorneys. Oh, the second wire is a duplicate. Two days later. And the last is dated yesterday. No word from you, so funeral tomorrow. Stop. Have been named administrator of your father's estate. Stop. You are again beneficiary because of John Jr. Signed Norman L. Tyre. John Jr. Again beneficiary because of John. Well, maybe I'm crazy, but I say the baby in this picture is John. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Back at the theater, I asked everybody if Estelle acted in any way peculiar the past few days, if she'd been frightened or worried. Yeah, and they all said that she was not upset. Well, then that's our answer. Inspector. Yeah, Mike? Somebody had better go back to the theater and pick up Dad, the old doorman. <laughs> Now, Dad, now I want you to be very careful. How many telegrams did you receive addressed to Estelle? Why, three to Estelle and one to the team of Carol and Hunter. Uh-huh. Now, um, you all remember that I asked uh, whether or not Estelle had shown any signs of being worried or upset? And you all said no. Yeah, that's yes, that's right. Three of these telegrams told of her father's death. Well, she certainly didn't say anything or show any signs of grief. The answer to that is easy, Mr. Hunter. She never saw those telegrams. They were deliberately withheld from her. But, but uh, I delivered them. At least I gave them to Mr. Hunter. You're right. I did withhold them. I didn't want Estelle to go to pieces and ruin our act. How long did you and Estelle work in that act, Mr. Hunter? Over three years. And during that time, your impression was that the locket she wore as a good luck charm contained a photograph of a man? Some fellow she was or had been in love with, I think you said. That's right. You're lying, Mr. Hunter. What do you mean? Does this look like the photo of a man? It's a baby. Estelle's baby. I don't know. I told you. You told us a lot that you didn't mean to, Mr. Hunter, but you didn't tell us that Estelle's baby was your baby, too. That you and Estelle were married, that you that you had the killer. I didn't. Oh, yes, you did. And you killed Frizee because he knew. Frizee found the baby's photograph. How, I don't know, but that doesn't matter. Frizee put two and two together. You had to kill him. I can only guess at your original motive, but uh, that's something I'm quite sure the inspector will wring from you when he gets you down to police headquarters. <laughs> There it is, Angel. I know, Mike, but I still don't see how Hunter could expect to get away with it. But didn't he know somebody would check up on those telegrams? Well, certainly, honey, but he miscalculated on one thing. Hmm? He didn't know a private detective was going to be backstage right after the killing. He didn't have time to plant the telegrams in Estelle's purse or dresser. Well, I don't understand how that would help. Why, sure it would. Then he would have played it differently. Hunter would have admitted the marriage. He would have told us Estelle and he were planning to leave the show because Estelle had come into her father's money. As I see it, the reason he had the killer was because she was going to divorce him. Oh, that would cut him off from Estelle's inheritance. Yes. Mike. Yes. Thought you'd like to know we just got a confession. Seems Estelle was planning to divorce Vic and... Ah, uh... just what I finished telling Phil, Inspector. Oh, oh, but there's one thing, one thing. How did Hunter make that phone call imitating Frizee? From the theater, Mike. He called Beverly to give himself an alibi. He wanted us to think Frizee was still alive while Hunter was in the theater. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the one question that worried me. <laughs> okay, Inspector, thanks a lot. Mm, Michael. Uh, yes? Uh, there's one more question, and it worries me. Hmm? When you were down in New Orleans, just how friendly were you with Beverly? Oh, why, Miss Knight. Well? <laughs> Uh, I may have an eye for figures, but, Angel, you certainly haven't got a head for them. <laughs> How old would you say Beverly is right now? Mm, 22, 23. She's 22. I told you I knew her in New Orleans ten years ago. Yes, ma'am, we were the scandal of her grammar school. Mike Shane, you deliberately led me on. You allowed me... <laughs> oh, <laughs> come here, you big lug. Oh, oh, Bev... What? I mean, the angel. (laughs) 
Remember, friends, the new 76 gasoline will give you a driving performance that will make you think of jet propulsion. Watch for the signs to go up in your neighborhood announcing the first shipments at your Union Oil Minuteman stations. Then, for a real thrill, drive in for your first tankful of the powerful new 76 gasoline, freshly blended from the huge 100-octane refineries of Union Oil Company, now going on sale at your Minuteman stations. Tune in again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. The characters of Sweeney and March were played by the comedy team of Sweeney and March. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make the new 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil. Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. This is Andrea J. Graham, author of the Web Surfer series. Oh, and a man's wife. You're listening to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. Welcome back. It's interesting that they got an actual comedy team to play a comedy team. So I guess that you could pretty much uh, eliminate Sweeney and March's suspects. Because, you know, uh, it used to be on a show like uh, Diagnosis Murder, they did a few episodes where people would play uh, roles that were like themselves. Like, they had an episode where uh, Regis and Kathy Lee, which for those of you who are a bit younger, were... uh, pretty uh, well-known uh, pair on uh, morning uh, television, but they played them under different names. The history of Sweeney and March is uh, interesting. They were certainly not a long-lived uh, comedy team, though they did get their own uh, radio series over uh, CBS, uh, but uh, didn't last uh, long. Uh, the comedy team had really been such a great institution in the uh, early decades of the uh, 20th century with so many great teams starting Abbott and Costello, Laurel and Hardy, Burns and Allen, Lum and Abner, and I I think it came more out of uh, an actor's uh, tradition. That's not really around today, so you don't see this uh, comedy team where two people's careers are so closely linked, uh, or you see it very rarely. And that's just, you know, because of a change in the culture of acting. Back in the, uh, you know, today... You know, if you're an actor, you want to stretch, you want to grow. You're a comedian, you don't want to do the same type of comedy, the same type of characters. You want fresh material, you want to pl- you want to really just be re- respected by everyone as the great talent that you are. In the 1920s or 1930s, the attitudes of actors and comedians could be better defined for the most part as, you know, I'd really like to uh, eat and be able to pay the rent. And so they would gladly go on for years and decades in a comedy team playing the exact same sort of character because the audience loved it and it paid the bills. Uh, Obviously, that was, you know, going out of vogue. Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis were probably the last of the great big uh, 
comedy teams, and that, of course, ended in a historic uh, breakup. Team of Sweeney and March didn't have that sort of historic breakup, but they did have separate careers. Um, March ended up with a career on television that really uh, took off. He was a game show host. Unfortunately, he was the host of the $64,000 question, and that ended up in a scandal, which pretty much put him out of work for a decade. Uh, uh, Sweeney, he uh, went ahead and he had a career that was really defined by his work uh, behind the camera. After a couple of short-lived uh, comedy series in the 1950s, including playing the lead in the TV version of Fibber McGee and Molly, where they didn't bring back the original cast, the series didn't last long, but he got the lead part as Fibber McGee. And who played Molly? None other than Kathy Lewis, who played Phyllis in the uh, Michael Shane uh, Private Detective. All right, well, that will actually do it for today. We will be back uh, tomorrow with uh, The Avenger. And join us back here next Monday for another episode of Michael Shane. And coming next Thursday, it's Mystery Theater featuring Mark Saber. Remember, support our uh, listener support campaign at support.greatdetectives.net or become one of our Patreon supporters at patreon.greatdetectives.net for as little as $2 a month. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio.